C.S. Lewis is one of the greatest world builders in all of literature. But in his short poem, The Future of Forestry, he doesn't imagine a world of lions, witches, or wardrobes. Rather, he imagines one of deforestation. And in doing so, not only does he predict the future, but he also might, just might, give us the key to saving it. Join me for a reading, summary, and analysis of The Future of Forestry. How will the legend of the age of trees feel when the last tree falls in England? When the concrete spreads and the town conquers the country's heart. When contraceptive tarmacs laid where farm has faded. Tram line flows where slept a hamlet. And shop fronts blazing without a stop from Dover to Rath have glazed us over. Simplest tales will then bewilder the questioning children. What was a chestnut? Say, what it means to climb a beanstalk. Tell me, grandfather, what is an elm? What was autumn? They never taught us. Then, told by teachers how once from mold came growing creatures of lower nature able to live and die, though neither beast nor man, and around them wreathing excellent clothing, breathing sunlight. Half understanding, their ill-acquainted fancy will tint their wonder paintings, trees as men walking, wood romances of goblins stalking in silky green, of milk sheen throth upon the lace of Hawthorne's collar, parlor in the face of birch girl. So shall a homeless time, though dimly catch from afar, for soul is watchful, a sight of tree delight of Eden. So I always tell my students the first thing you need to know when analyzing poetry is what all the words mean. So I put some of the tricky ones from the first half of the poem up there, and you can look at them in your own need. Some of these you'll already know, I'm sure. But one that I had to look up just to be sure is Dover to Rath is the southernmost point to the northernmost point of Britain. Dover way in the south and Rath way in the north. That's not counting like the big, or I'm sorry, the small islands, just the main Wales, England, Scotland island. I mean Maine because it's biggest. I don't mean that it's the most important. I know that's sensitive. Anyway, moving on, let's talk about what this uh, <laughs> stanza actually, or this section of the poem actually means here. So I highlighted the questions because this poem starts with a question and then it flows into many more. And you see Lewis imagines a world a generation or two removed from the age of trees. And in doing so, he creates a different type of wasteland. It's one of infrastructure rather than rubble. It's one of urban sprawl rather than nuclear proliferation um, and destruction. It's a self-inflicted one. And it leads to these questioning children that we'll pick up more in the next half of the poem. Uh, what was a chestnut? Uh, what was autumn? Tell me what it means to climb a beanstalk. Uh, the idea that children wouldn't know what trees are because we've covered them with contraceptive tarmac and shop fronts have blazed without stop from the north to the south. Sorry, south to the north. Um, this is a very interesting idea, and it's one that in many ways has come true in our cities, um, and who knows how far that will continue to go. In our next half of the poem, you see again some interesting stuff here. I want to especially point out Hawthorne's collar and Birch Girl, which are very confusing sort of images, but I take it as a personification of the trees. And we'll kind of get into that, especially the birch ties nicely with uh, Poller, which is an unhealthy pale appearance, and of course a birch tree has white bark. So you get the idea of an, a, a pale girl as the birch tree has become a girl because these children know what a girl is. They don't know what a birch is. They know what a collar is. They don't know what a hawthorn is. So they, they're trying to um, make comparisons in their mind to make sense of these things they've never seen. So picking up off of that, um, in the green here, we talk about that idea of the spectacular. Lewis imagines people that don't know what trees are, so they have to be described to them. Um, trees that can live and die, that they're neither beast nor man. They wear excellent clothing and they breathe sunlight, which is such an awesomely poetic description of a tree. And then later on, you see what children think of them, this childlike wonder of goblins stalking in silky green, of the, the hawthorn wearing a collar or the birch tree being a girl. Um, it almost becomes like a dinosaur. You think of how children imagine dinosaurs. We don't know what they look like, but we create games out of them and we make drawings of them. And many of those are not very close to what a dinosaur may have actually looked like or 
the noises we make are probably not what they sounded like. Um, that's scary to think that that could ever happen with, you know, trees. And I'm not saying it would. He's, he's being poetic here to make a point. Um, but there's certainly lots of animals since dinosaurs that have disappeared from the earth. And we spend time on the Wikipedia uh, extinct species page fascinated by all these creatures that we'll, we'll never see in person. And then finally, to wrap up the poem here, it kind of arcs towards hope. The soul's watchfulness for Eden suggests a chance at redemption. And of course, Eden is a very tree-heavy section of the Bible. Uh, there's some important stuff with the trees in that uh, section of Genesis, if you haven't read it. So the idea that the soul is watchful for a, a, a sight of tree-delighted Eden, that the soul yearns for the trees, I think is um, a sign that we're not there yet, and our souls don't want us to be there. No one, no matter what they feel about environmentalism wants all the trees destroyed. So maybe that's enough to keep keep us going as a species and keep the, the nature of Earth going. So why art? I said this poem could possibly save the world. And I don't mean this poem alone. I mean art in general has the ability to help alter the way we operate and kind of prevent the destruction of the environment. Uh, that we hear so much about. So I want to give you four reasons why I think art can do this. Uh, number one is Percy Shelley said that poets were the legislators of the world. Poets have the responsibility to help guide the world's actions, um, to kind of steer people in the right direction because it's concentrated thought, it's concentrated language. So it can be more powerful than just the language we say in everyday speech. So how do they do that? Well, one thing art does is it inspires empathy. I dare you to read Blake's The Chimney Sweeper poems and not burn with anger at child labor. And that's just one example. Poetry and art, I mean, you have Uncle Tom's Cabin with American slavery. You have uh, films like uh, Fail Safe and uh, Dr. Strangelove with the Cold War. Uh, you have child labor, like I said here with the chimney sweeper. You have all these instances of art helping give voice to the voiceless. And nature is a very voiceless um, voiceless thing uh, that I think art can, can work with. And art and nature are intertwined. Um, Hamlet said that uh, uh, art, and art holds a mirror up to nature, right? And whether it be plays or paintings or poems... Uh, or songs, they're, they're connected to the earth. So I think we've drawn so much inspiration from nature that artists are naturally inclined to preserve it and try and save it. And finally, facts only go so far. I didn't know what picture to put for this, so I put this one. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that say when you present someone with the facts, it doesn't change their mind. In fact, it can even dig them in deeper and make them more resigned to their own opinions. So if speaking to the brain isn't always working, sometimes we need to speak to the heart. You know, there's a reason why those commercials with sad music and puppies uh, are able to inspire so many people to donate, because it speaks to their heart. When in our brain, we think, well, there's better things than puppies out there that need money, like starving children. But for some reason, they don't speak to our heart as much, which is very sad, I think. Um, but if you can speak to someone's heart, and that's what art specializes in, to their emotion and evoking it, then... I think you have a chance to, to help them see. And I didn't want this video to be political, and I hope it didn't come off as political. I just think um, it doesn't matter if carbon emissions are making the world hotter or not. We should all want the world to be as clean and healthy as possible. So it shouldn't be a political issue, and it shouldn't matter uh, what the exact causes are. We should strive to be good stewards of this earth. And if we can do that, I think we'll be all right. So thank you for watching. One more last thing. Um, I always like to look at lasting influence. I first heard about this poem because of a, a super cool, I'm pretty sure California-based band from like five years ago or so. I don't know if they're still making music. I don't think they are, but they're called Future of Forestry. They have some really ethereal music, um, kind of folksy, really good stuff. Check them out uh, if you liked this poem because they took their band name from C.S. Lewis's kind of under-read poem. But I hope you enjoyed reading it. If you did, please feel free to like, subscribe. Um, but more than that, ask me any questions about it, start a discussion, suggest other poems that you think speak to saving nature. 
or to other causes that are close to your heart. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll catch you next time. Happy reading. Have a good one.